Hi and welcome to the uh, second part of the first lecture for week one of this course. Uh, in the first part we gave you some really big things. We looked at some of the critical issues that are facing uh, mass education uh, in Queensland and Australia but also you'd see the same things across most parts of the world. I hope you've had a chance to then follow up all those links and activities from that first lecture. Or maybe you're watching the, them one after the other and then you're going to do the activities after. But there's some really important ideas there and I hope that it, um, you find time around your busy work and, and life schedules to, to do that and uh, engage with them. Also this week I hope you um, enjoy your tutorials. You've got some really good tutors across your courses with lots of practical experience in the classroom. Um, and they'll really help you with uh, putting these things into practice. So today we want to look at the curriculum and some of the state, national and international perspectives. Um, some of these things are, are quite current and you might have heard about, um, but just to try and put things into pers some perspective. So the first of all, we'll look at the spirit of the Australian Maths curriculum and be aware that this is being revised and you'll get a new one very soon. Um, but the spirit of it won't change. Um, and then we'll look at the components of the curriculum and again you're getting a new one but most of the components will be similar. In fact if you look at the maths curriculum over the last 40 years it looks almost the same every time just packaged and reorganised differently. Uh, and then we'll do some sort of just for fun some interesting mapping around countries of Singapore and Finland. These are two countries that have been seen as uh, world leaders in maths education. And finally then we'll look at some of the things that influence the implement implementation of the curriculum. Uh, and while this might seem a bit out there, remember this is the thing that eventually comes down and you have to take and implement with your learners in your classroom. So, th this current Australian Maths curriculum, uh, the one that's going to be obsolete ver very soon, was written by Professor Peter Sullivan and he works at Monash University. And he's a friend of mine. He, he's a really nice guy. He's a really practical guy, really concerned about what happens in classrooms. He spends a lot of time working with schools around um, maths education, trying to work with teachers as they work out how to do the best job possible teaching mathematics in schools. Uh, and he's written some really uh, practical books. Uh, one's about asking good questions, which should be in the library as well. Uh, I suggest you, if you get a chance, you can grab it. It's actually a physical real book that's on the shelf. He also wrote The Shape of the Australian uh, Curriculum for Mathematics. So the first thing is in the curriculum you've got content, processes and proficiencies. Uh, and all these three parts are supposed to be integrated together. Because the idea is mathematics is not just a whole pile of knowledge you need to stuff in your head. It's a way of looking at the world. It's some tools that help you understand and work in the world in real and practical ways. So in the curriculum, in the current one, they're called content strands, and it's the knowledge you have to know. You're probably aware, number and algebra, measurement and geometry, statistics and probability. Now, if you went to any other country, they'd have almost the same content strands. They might not lump them together, they might have number separate from algebra, measurement separate from geometry, statistics separate from probability. They might call it something else. I think uh, for a while statistics was called data, probability was called chance. But they're the same thing, the same stuff. And the new curriculum, you can bet your bottom dollar that those things will be there again. So the content is always there. That is the substance of mathematical knowledge, but it is not all of mathematics. Mathematics is also, is not just something that's a, a body of knowledge that exists, it's also something you do and you should experience it and uh, in their classroom it's a way of doing mathematics and we call these in this curriculum processes in the American curriculum they call them pr mathematical practices uh, in the past it's called mathematical ways ways of doing or ways of working things like that but all these things whatever they're called are ways of doing mathematics so you've got to know you can't do things unless you have the knowledge and the content to work with, but it's not enough just to know the content. You have to do something with it. And the last thing at this stage is called proficiency, which is about fluency, understanding, problem solving and reasoning. All integral parts of mathematics. So as you learn things, as you do mathematics, you want to become more fluent at it. You want to not just be able to do it, but you want to understand it. 
You want to solve problems with it and you want to argue and reason about things using these tools. So here's some of the key messages that came from Peter Sullivan uh, about the curriculum. And although these were key things about the curriculum, you may, need, you may not always notice these when you go around schools and, and in classrooms yet. <coughs> but of course, we're relying on you to do this when you start your career uh, and we sh we're confident you can do it. And, and the key message was we really need to inter integrate the content with fluency and understanding, with problem solving and reasoning, with student interests and levels of confidence and with teaching mathematics. Integrate it, not separate. So we don't do a whole pile of stuff on um, measurement and then we do some problem solving after. It does it at the same time. They're integrated together. We need to integrate it with student interests. So when they engage with something, they see it as something relevant to their lives, not just some stuff that's over there. We need to be cognizant of their confidence. So all these things need to be integrated together. And the big, one of the biggest challenges is doing that because often we treat them separate. Learn the content and then we'll do the other stuff after. And if you learn the other stuff, if you do the other stuff after, that's okay, but make sure you cover the content because that's the most important thing. Now if you're doing that, you're not actually teaching the curriculum because the curriculum sees them all together. It's a bit like if I wanted to teach you to play cricket and I said to you, right, for the first, first of all, we're just going to learn the rules. We'll learn the rules uh, we'll, and then we'll look at some technical videos of how to um, bat and bowl and then later on we'll go out and actually play a game. To learn to cr play cricket, the best way to do it is to start playing and you'll learn the techniques, you'll learn the rules as you go. So that's what we mean by integrating it together. And this comes right from the person who wrote the curriculum. Now, although we have the Australian Maths curriculum, uh, legally still, Queensland is responsible for what happens in schools in Queensland. Now, up to year 10, Queensland simply just adopts the Australian curriculum. But uh, the Australian curriculum in Queensland has prepared a document through the Assessment Authority, <coughs> and that talks specifically about what happens here. For all intents and purposes, it's the same as the Australian curriculum that you might download from ACARA. But the structure of the curriculum in Queensland uh, is listed there. I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's there for you to look at. You can see that the strands there, number and algebra, measurement and geometry, and statistics and probability are exactly the same ones as the Australian curriculum. And if you follow that link there, that'll take you to the website where the curriculum is. Now, back in the old days when I started teaching, when they changed the curriculum, they'd send you an actual book uh, with a curriculum in it. Nowadays, it's all on a website. Uh, and that's good because it's easy to access and fiddle around with. Um, the only thing I'm always a bit careful of is they can't, they, it's easy to change a website very quickly, um, which they haven't done yet. But it's worth looking at it. This is the content uh, of the stuff you should be teaching and not just the content, the proficiencies and the um, processes as well. So you should visit that site and have a look at it and see what um, is required. I'm pretty confident you've probably had a look at it in your practicum as you've done some planning for teaching on prac. Now you'll notice in the curriculum that they have these things called achievement standards. Uh, and this is what, well again, you've done assessment courses, but these are the things that the students are supposed to be able to do after they've done it. Uh, again, it's the content just rewritten in a different way. But it's worth looking at them because that tells you, I guess, the mark of where you should be heading with your students. Um, and it gives you an idea of the depth of understanding and the sophistication about how they should use each of these things. So at the moment, it has the content descriptors there and then it has the uh, standards underneath, which are essentially the same things written in a different way. But that's what they're useful for and that's how you can know what the students are required to do when they finish your maths program. And again, I won't go through all this again, but it talks about the content descriptions, which are at each level, and even in places they'll have elaborations, which give you more detail about what they are. Uh, what it'll also do is help you link to where you might use um, different uh, technology uh, and where you might integrate other cross-curricular priorities. So again, I'm pretty sure you've probably looked at this during your practicum and planning, <coughs> but what the main thing is, yes, there are curriculum content strands, but that's not all there is to the curriculum. So you do need to look at these, but you need to look at them as integrated with the other parts.
if you only teach the content strands, you haven't actually taught the curriculum. And again, um, what we've done here is map this with the Singapore and the Finland curriculum. The reason we've done Singapore and Finland, if you want to know, is they've done very well in NAPLAN and uh, not NAPLAN, sorry, in PISA and TIMS, which are the International Studies of Mathematical Achievement. Now, <coughs> we've done this just for interest sake. Singapore is, is more recently done well. Finland initially did well and they've actually dropped off a bit now. But it's, it's a bit simplistic because you've got to remember these are different contexts in which the schools and societies operate. So if you go to a school in Finland, um, some of you might have seen that video that was on Facebook for a while about can we have schools like Finland. Uh, in Finland, to be a, ma a primary school teacher, you need at least a master's degree, and some of them have PhDs. Uh, teachers in Finland are seen as the highest rank in society. You know, if you say you're a teacher, they go, oh, that's wonderful. Whereas here, we're sort of seen as maybe a bit ordinary. Um, they're held in very high esteem. Uh, teachers in Finland just teach their classes. They don't do yard duty or sports coaching. They don't spend hours um, doing assessment and things like that. They have a very small curriculum document where they just decide what they want to teach the kids themselves. So the Finnish uh, system says rather than controlling all our teachers with lots of documents and performance management systems, we just em employ very good teachers and then let them go and do their job. So all that being said, uh, Finnish kids don't do any homework much by the way until they get at least till they're older um, and their school days are relatively short and have a lot of time for play. Uh, Singapore is different again, uh, it's a very driven society where parents are very keen for the students to do well at school and, and often the kids in Singapore will go to school and then go to tutoring after. They're very good at doing tests. Um, but they're also very good at problem solving and they emphasise that a lot. In their classrooms they have a lot of investigations and those sorts of things. But anyway, if you look at the content, you, that document, have a look and see what you think, remembering that the contexts are different. Uh, and you can see some things that are similar and some are different, but often people want to compare us, particularly politicians, to these countries and say, why can't we do as good as these things, these countries? And, and the answer is often because there's cultural and societal differences that make it difficult. But, but have a look, see what you think. Are there some ideas there that you could um, take into your classroom? Now this little video is quite interesting. It's called Truth and Myths About Singapore Maths. Um, because one of the things we think, oh, Singapore is an Asian country, all these kids just do maths the whole time, the whole, and they just sit there and practice doing tests. And, and that's not true at all. They do a lot of problem solving, their classes are very collaborative, and the kids come in and are, uh, are challenged around lots of ideas. They're encouraged to think freely and to collaborate and to reason and think mathematically. Uh, and the teachers deliver the curriculum in a wide variety of ways. Uh, and it's a myth to think that they just stand there and lecture them all the time. So have a look, see if that interests, and, and again, are there any ideas here that would help you with your teaching? <coughs> in Finland, um, again, there's a couple of videos there. Everyone has lauded Finland as the great, uh, great country for achieving in, in these tests, and they did for a while. And it's worth having a look at it and seeing what they do. Are there some things and ideas here that you could take for your own classroom? Um, you'll notice that the students spend a lot of time engaged in investigating, explaining their ideas, communicating them and then getting them having arguments and debates with each other about is it a good idea, do you think this would work, etc, etc, etc. So again, for your interest but also to help inform your practice because these are held up, often you'll get told, oh look at what they do over there, isn't it wonderful, why can't we do this? So I hope you find that interesting and you get a chance to look at them. Some of the key messages you can take from Finland, and I don't want to preempt you watching the video. Um, but in essence, the teacher collaborates a lot with the students rather than standing at the front and, and delivering the curriculum per se. The students have got a lot of autonomy, the teachers have a lot of autonomy, they're trusted to do the job, no one really checks on them much. Uh, students are, are expected to take responsibility for their own sort of learning. Have a look. Now, um, some of the factors influencing the implementation of the curriculum relate to things like conjecturing and generalising. So some people would argue that generalising is the heart of mathematics. So here's some things to try. 
3 times 2 times 4 equals 3 times 2 times 4. Is that true? Is it always true? Is it true for all the operations? The product of three numbers remains the same, whichever ones are multiplied first. Would this be true if we change it to different operations? Why is that the case? So this is the sort of question that kids will be given in Finland or Singapore and asked to come up with some answers. Or another one, 2 times 1 squared equals 2 times 1 all squared. Is that true? Is it sometimes true? Is it sometimes false? So some of the lessons I've been when I've been seen when I've been over there, the teacher puts up a problem like one of these two things and then asks the students to go away and work on it in groups and come up with their answers and their ideas. And then they'll debate them and then they'll go away and work on it again. They don't stand there and give them the rule. Students copy it in their books. They then go to their textbook and practice 50 exercises. They do this sort of stuff first. They investigate, they try, and then they try and come up with some sort of generalised they conjecture and they come up with some not sort of generalised or a rule or, a, or something together. It's an interesting way of teaching and it helps often cover the content in a different way. And what it does is you'll find the students actually recall it much better because they've generated the knowledge themselves rather than just being told. And at the same time they've been involved in mathematical processes. Something for you to try. They often solve non-routine problems They make and make connections. And again, here's some answers. Uh, here's a question you can try for yourself. I, I won't read it to you now. Um, but it's a sort of a word problem, but maybe a slightly different one from some of the word problems that we've been giving to students uh, around here. The students might only do one or two problems in a lesson rather than doing 50. And here's a U2, a U2 example you might uh, consider. This was taken from a real U2 class in Singapore. So my first challenge is to have a go at yourself and then think about how could I use this with a year two class? What, how does it relate to the curriculum? What maths are they learning? What processes are they learning? What proficiencies are they developing at the same time? So I'm going to leave you with these few examples at the end for you, again for you to try in your own time. Um, of course these slides are all in the uh, Learning at Griffith site for you to uh, look at and go and follow the links. So that ends the first week. Good on you for getting this far. Uh, if you're in Math 3, you must be getting near the end of your uh, degree. And so I hope this is not just um, expanding your mind to different ideas and helping you think in different ways, but also helping you develop real practical ways about how will you teach mathematics when you start your career as a teacher, which isn't far away. As a society, we're depending on you to build a generation of kids who love and engage in mathematics in deep and in meaningful ways. And we're confident you can do it. Okay, thank you.